Right. I see that many of us have joined already. So we're good to go. We're good to start. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We are starting our winter today together at the exclusive podcast from the cozy Ilogos office. So who is with us today? Um, let me do some quick round of short introductions. We have David Malik. David Mullich has worked in the game dev for over 40 years. He produced DuckTales for Disney, designed Heroes of Might and Magic 3, Vampire the Masquerade, and many others. Right now, he teaches game design, works as a consultant, and believes the perfect game has to be easy to learn and difficult to master. A famous and I wouldn't be afraid of saying legendary after even the taxi driver recognized him just now <laughs> when we were driving here. A, I would say a legendary game producer and game designer. Uh, over 40 years in the game industry, fairly referred as father of many games of Heroes of Might and Magic franchise, Lord of the Rings game, producer of Vampire, The Masquerade Bloodlines of Activision, the Walt Disney Company's first video game producer, and the person who um, has actually a game character in Heroes named after him. Uh, who's else with us today? Uh, Alexey Yurchenko, art director and head of art at Ilogos Game Studios. Um, he's been in game dev for 11 years, worked as an artist, as an art lead, as an art director on casual games and PC games. Um, we have Ilya Vasilyev, one of Ilogos key project managers and producers. He's been in game development and project manager for five years, worked on a variety of different projects from casual mobile games to AAA projects, and he's actually experienced in both outsourcing and product development. And uh, my name is Svetlanka. I'm a chief business development officer in uh, iLogos and a board member. And I'm actually a business representative here because among this producing and art game specialist, there should be some kind of, you know, business balance. And that's why I'm a moderator today. So let's start. Let's go. And um, I would like to start with the questions related to game development as a whole. Um, David, there are not so many people out there who have like over 40 years of experience in the game industry. I don't have 40 years of experience in life at all, <laughs> but you have 40 in game development industry. So let's take a helicopter view on the industry. Like where do you see the most differences in game development in the processes, in the um, products, um, in people who are involved in the industry, let's say now, 20 years ago and 40 years ago? Well, that's going back a long time. When I started 40 years ago, it really was a, a, a what we would call a cottage industry. It wasn't very well developed. There weren't very many business people like you. And we, we were, which, which is very important now, but back then we didn't know how to sell our games. We didn't, I, I don't think we even thought of it as a business at first. It was just something that we loved to do and had to do. It, it very much is like the indie, was, was like the indie development of today, um, but, but even less sophisticated. In the early days, we, we invented a lot of the genres that are popular today. And, and some of the early, certainly some of the early games I made wouldn't even fit into a genre that, that there is today. So there was a lot of experimentation, a lot of, lot of maybe amateurishness about, about, about the games, not a lot of polish, but, but a lot of heart to them. And then going to 20 years ago, a lot more professionalism, games got bigger, companies got bigger, they started to recognize the value in games, that, that it was a good business model, and now today it's big business. Big, big business. Uh, and uh, the big companies, they, they don't like to take a lot of risk because there's so much money invested in it. But there's kind of a resurgence back to some of that innovation we had in the, in the early days through indie game development. And that's where I see some of the most exciting games done today. But on the other hand, I also see a lot of the professionalism that's done with, with, the, uh, with the big companies. So it, it, there's a lot more variety today, a lot more types of games for every type of people. And now, now everyone's playing games. Used to be in the early days, 
It was for a very niche odd audience, very, very young people. And now it's all ages, all types. Everyone plays games now. So that, that it, it's been exciting to see the game industry change over all these years. Thanks a lot. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Right now there are so many audiences and so many different cohorts the games can be tailored for. And I'd like Ilya to, for you to jump in here, as I know you wanted to discuss something about the historical perspective. Yeah. Hi, Svetlanka. Hi, David, and hi to everybody. So, uh, David, starting in the late 70s, early 80s with the video games industry, such young industry itself, what were the main challenges that lay before the developers and maybe the challenges that were in getting the games into the players' hands and playing them, getting to know them, everything that might have happened in general? Oh, it was, all, it was the, I'd say the biggest challenge was distribution, actually getting it into the hands of developers. Back, back in the early days, uh, there were... Uh, there were, of course, no internet. There was there, were, there was no Steam, there uh, and and there were no chain uh, uh, game stores. They were all a bunch of small little stores in the United States, um, spread all across the country. And I remember when I started up my own company uh, in, around 1985, uh, I had to go and cold call a lot of individual stores one by one, trying to get them to sell our games. Uh, so it, it was very hard to get into people's hands. Uh, we would advertise in game hobbyist magazines, uh, some very crude ads. Uh, uh, and then, uh, then Electronic Arts came by. And of course, Electronic Arts was one of the, the first big game publishers. And they, uh, they, uh, they were able to uh, master distribution into all these different stories that are out there. And so... Uh, With my company, Electric Transit, we were able to s sign a, a distribution deal with Electronic Arts, and that, that allowed us to get our games out in the hands of many more people. So uh, early early days was a struggle just getting our games out there into, in, into players' hands. It was a real hobbyist industry, uh, and, and you know it's tough to get to when you have a bunch of small groups of people you're trying to communicate with. That It's difficult. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, David. Cold calling, I definitely, as a you know, salesperson, person coming from the sales background, totally feel the pain. Oh, uh, it's hard. It's hard cold calling. <laughs> Absolutely. It helps if you can sing a little bit, which I can't do. Yeah, you can sing a little bit or you can apply some jokes. In iLogos, we have some secrets to, yes. you know, to customer calls. Um, here's what happens to the game community here in Eastern Europe. So every time there's a new article about a new game technology rollout or about some new game release on VentureBeat or games business or any kind of media that is popular, the community is immediately divided into two arguing groups. Whereas one group is saying that oh, game dev is not as it used to be, the time of masterpieces are over, and they are like crying and being sad. Another one is more like, oh, I love where, where, it's ta where it takes, excited to see what's next. So are you in the group uh, of those who are like romanticizing these good old times, or do you believe that the biggest game masterpiece is still yet to come? I'm in both groups. I do romanticize the old both. times. Yeah, I, I, I love the old games. They were a lot of fun to play, but I'm also excited for what's next. And there's no reason, there's no reason that we can't have We continue to have fun, innovative games. I see it in indie game development, and and also in AAA games. There's a, there's a lot of lot of artistry involved in that. Good, solid game design, nice, great art, great great music. Uh, you, you can have it in both. I, we, I romanticize about the past. I'm eager about the future. Well, that's. That's an unexpected reply. I wouldn't expect both, uh, but it's interesting. So. Uh, The next, I would say, the next part of questions uh, would be about your background with Heroes of Might and Magic. I would say that it's the most intriguing part to us, because actually, when we just announced this podcast, um, lots of iLogos people texted me uh, before our meeting and saying, oh my God, you're going to speak to the father of my happy childhood, because uh, heroes are huge in the country, in Ukraine, a lot, you know, the whole generation has grown uh, playing heroes. So I'd like to invite Alexei to speak here and to ask his questions about your background with the game. 
Go ahead. I'm ready for them. Thank you, Svetlanka. Hi, David. Hi, audience. Um, uh, David, so I know that uh, your contribution to the creation of the Heroes of Might and Magic game series can hardly be over, um, overestimated. And it was noted and immortalized by, by your colleagues almost immediately in the creation of a game character uh, in your name. And um, what was the most difficult part of your production job on these games? The most difficult part was we were following Heroes of Might Magic 2, which was one of the greatest games ever made. And when I was uh, hired by New World Computing or, or even offered the job, I had to think about how can I, can I possibly do something that's, that even lives up to the name of the Heroes of Might Magic series? I was worried there was only, I, w I would only be able to fail. So that, that was the biggest challenge. And what uh, I, I, pl I played Heroes for, for about a week, Heroes 2. And I'm going, this is a great game. What can I do to add to the franchise? And I thought it would be in the artwork. I thought the artwork, while nice, it, it was colorful, but maybe a couple years behind the times. So my, my main goal in developing Heroes 3, um, among you know, creating, creating a, another great game in the franchise, was to improve the artwork. And that, that was probably my biggest focus uh, at the time. Uh, making more, what I called, I was looking for something that, that I called extreme fantasy. Something a little bit more like Warhammer uh, in, in terms of the artwork. Something a little bit grittier. And, uh, and, and not, not quite, quite as fanciful, while still having all the mythological elements that, that people could, uh, everywhere could relate to. Uh, so uh, I focused with the artwork, and luckily I had a really great art team behind me, um, led by Phelan Sykes, who was, who was our art director. And uh, that, that, that was probably my main focus, while maintaining the good game balance and the, the, the great gameplay that the previous Heroes games had. And with skilled dragons, of course. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, did you realize mm, that basically you're working on 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 some potential hit, or in, at that time that was mm, I, unclear? I, well, it was already a hit uh, with Heroes Two, so I, I wanted to make sure that uh, that we uh, we were as successful as a previous game. But I never thought in terms of a hit. I was I was I was mostly thinking. Don't fail, don't fail, don't fail. Okay. Did you think that maybe um, that time you could, you could have done something different than... Oh, I, I don't look, no, I, I don't look back and, 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 and think about what I could have done differently. Um, I had a really great group of people I was working with, and I think we all worked to our full potential. We all enjoyed working together, which I think really shows through in the game. If, if there's anything that I can say about the magic behind Heroes of Might and Magic 3 was that it was a great balance between programming and music and art and design. It all just all works together so well. And I think that's because the team got together uh, along with each other so well. We all communicated well. We enjoyed each other's company. We all wanted to make a great game. And I think that all came through in the final product. So go, looking back, I don't think I could have made any improvements to it. In terms of gameplay, yeah, I could have made, we could have made like Eagle Eye a much better magic spell to use. That's something everyone complains about. <laughs> Why did you put an Eagle Eye? It, it sucks as a spell. All right. Yeah, looking back, that could have been improved. A couple other spells could have been improved. Maybe maybe some creatures could have had their stats changed. But, you know, that that's all little details, and you never know. If you change one little thing, that could wind up making everything else worse. So, no, everyone's happy with it, it seems. There's some disagreement about which is better, Heroes of My Magic 2 or his Heroes of My Magic 3. But, you know, enough people liked it. I'm happy. I'm satisfied. I'm not going to look back. Uh, we made some ha people's happy childhoods, I hear. So, that, that just pleases me. Alexei, just a small request from the audience uh, to speak a bit louder as they just didn't hear you. Yeah, I'll try. Um, okay, so Heroes of Might and Magic 3 has inspired the whole generation of players and undoubtedly greatly influenced the evolution of the gaming industry itself. 
so do you think it is possible to create a turn-based strategy today that could also appeal uh, to players and influence in the industry um, today? I think so. Um, I, the, I've, I've played some turn-based strategy games, and, and certainly the, 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 the Civilization series remains great. Uh, I will say that I... That uh, Heroes uh, Heroes Three's chief game designer Greg Fulton is now working on a uh, a sp spiritual successor to Heroes of Might and Magic Three called Fanstratix, and uh, I, I've been following his development on that. And I, and I know more about the game than has been revealed, but uh, uh, I encourage everyone to go onto the uh, to Fanstratix.com and follow what Greg Fulton is doing. Uh, I I think it's. He's, he's, he's working on something that could be a very promising successor to the Heroes of Mind Magic series. So I, I do think it's possible. If anyone can pull it off, he can. Okay, and what would anyone need or require to achieve this type of success? What yeah. are the components? <laughs> it's always hard. You know, it, it's, it's like lightning in a bottle. It's magic when everything comes together. Uh, it, if, if I were to give you the right formula, Someone could still follow it exactly and, and not necessarily come up with a great game. You only know in hindsight what worked well. But, uh, you know, it, it's, here are the secrets of, of any great game. It's got to be very easy to learn, you know, and then difficult, difficult to master, as everyone says. Yes, you know, not too complex to start off with. I, I, I teach game design uh, to college students. And... There are two mistakes they always make. The very, very new students, they tend to make the games too hard to begin with. They make it for themselves. But because they're experts in playing their own game, they tend to make the challenge very high so that when someone else is playing it, they, they forget that the purpose of, 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 of us making games as game developers, we're making entertainment for other people. We're trying to make, give, provide fun experiences to someone else. So we have to make sure that someone who steps in new is going to have fun with it. So don't make it too hard, and then don't make it too complex, at least to start off with. Uh, you can have a game that has a lot of rules and a lot of information, a lot of different factions, but don't give them too much to start off with. Kind of give them a little bit, start them off with a little bit to have to, to, to figure out, a little bit to have to know about the game rules and what they have to keep track of, the amount of information, but then build on that over time. So... Uh, uh, keep mindful that your players, when they first start playing your game, they don't know much about it. They're not very skilled in it. Give them time to you to get adjusted to playing your game. You can you can make a complex game that's uh, that, that's hard to play, but but unless you're unless you're designing specifically for hardcore players, ease your player into it. Okay, thank you. That is very inspiring. One another question for me is, um, well, basically, Might and Magic's Hero 7 is the la latest, so, so to say, installment in the game series today. And uh, um, I've played this game, this game a little bit, and my impression that it was that uh, they've changed uh, the whole franchise a lot. And um, in your opinion, how do Might and Magic Hero 7 compare favorably with the previous part of the game uh, series? And did they represent the same idea that were put in the, into the original concept? I can't answer that question because I haven't played Heroes of Might and Magic 7. I will tell you in general, it's very difficult to make anything, a, a sequel in any franchise. Hmm. Because you have, to, you have to balance between what do I keep from the previous version that, that people liked, but still change it enough that it's worth experiencing the sequel. That's a real tough balance to make. I was, uh, it was fu funny, in the, in the cab ride over here, the, uh, the cab driver was a big Heroes of Mind Magic fan. He said that he liked Heroes of Mind Magic 3, but he didn't like Heroes of Mind Magic 4. <laughs> and I, I produced both games, so I said, what didn't you like about it? And he said, Heroes 4 seemed like a different type of game. There was too much role-playing in that. I said, what do you mean by that? And it's because this, this time around in Hero, Heroes 4, it, you controlled the hero. The hero, was a, the hero was a separate creature that could go on the battlefield and you could develop it, and it changed it too much. And that was my fault. That was my idea to, uh, to, to have the, the hero out on the battlefield. So uh, 
I, I thought that would be an interesting change to make to keep the game fresh, but I got the balance a little bit, at least for that player. And maybe, maybe for other players got the balance a little bit off. So that it's, it's always tough with sequels. You can't make the same game over and over and over again. Uh, but how much do you change it so that it's enough to keep it fresh and interesting, but uh, not lose not lose the magic from before. So uh, I, I, I I appreciate what Ubisoft is doing. I'm glad they're maintaining the franchise, but inevitably each sequel is going to be a little bit different. So maybe it'll appeal to some. It, it didn't appeal to you as much. Maybe it appealed to some other people. I don't know. It's I'm not going to judge them. I'm I'm just grateful they're trying. Okay, and here's the question from Alexander, our co-founder. What is your favorable uh, Heroes series? My, my, my favorite of the games? Yes. Oh, Heroes of My Magic 3. Uh, that's my favorite. That was, that was my guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've, I've, made, I've made over 60 games in my career, mm -hmm. and almost always, by the time uh, the game is released, I am so sick of playing it. Remember, in game development, most of the time when you're playing your own game, it's not fun to play yet doesn't become fun to play until the hopefully until the very end so most games are not fun to play when you're working on them and, and by the time I'm re it's released I'm sick of the game I never want to see it again the only exception was Heroes of Might Magic 3 that I continue to play after it was released uh, because it was just such a fun game so that's my favorite that's true and uh, just as a sneak peek of some sort will there be Heroes 8 I don't know. I hope so. I hope they continue it. I'm, I'm not involved in the series anymore. That's all in, in Ubisoft's hands. So I, I, I don't know if they're planning an eight. I hope so. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexei, for your questions. And thank you, David, for the replies. Uh, I think it's very sort of, you know, inspiring message to the producers and game designers who are actually listening to us today um, about, you know, a dream of making the game uh, that would be fun to play, even though you worked on it. That, <laughs> that I think it sounds like an interesting and inspiring challenge to all. Um, heroes are fantastic and a big topic, and I'm sure that we could speak about heroes like till till the sun is down. Uh, still. We know there are a lot of other exciting projects you worked on. So um, I'd like to invite Ilya to speak because I know he liked Vampire, the Masquerade Bloodlines. So Ilya, please go for it. Likely that's not the word that I would use. It's absolutely one of my favorite RPGs of all time. But the questions that I wanted to ask you basically with the project of this scale and the so much of the stuff going on with it, uh, maybe you could explain what was your approach and involvement in the adjusting the course of development itself. Maybe some decisions that were made behind keeping some parts of the game or the story in and what gets cut, basically. How was the how was it made? Well, I, I didn't get involved in in uh, in bloodlines until it was already a year and a half in development. Uh, it was uh, Traco Studios that was developing the game, and uh, I was—I I had actually been brought on to Activision to work on a Star Trek game. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, we we uh, Activision ended its contract with Paramount to do Star Trek games, and the game I was working on got canceled. And here was Masquerade, the Blood, uh, Masquerade, uh, Vampire, the Masquerade Bloodlines that had been in development for for a year, and there really wasn't a producer assigned to it from from Activision. Uh, so it and the problem was that it was being developed using the uh, the the new Source engine that Valve was developing for Half Life Two, and so Troik was using that engine while it was being developed, and every time there was a big change in it, it would set them back. Uh, a long time, so there was a lot of what what we would call in the United States spinning the wheels. A lot of work being done, but there wasn't wasn't forward progress in the game. So I was I, I was assigned to, to to that game to get it done, get it finished. So already the, a lot of the design had been done by the time I got up aboard it. My job was was to get it completed, and uh, so that was that was my big focus. Uh, one of the big challenges was was working with Valve and making sure the communications were clear, 
and uh, about changes that were making to the game engine. So a lot of work hadn't had to, uh, so so a lot of work wouldn't have to be redone. And then also with with Troika, getting them to actually finish the game. Uh, because they 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 would want they, they're game designers. They love playing games. And, you know, it's never quite finished. And so I had I, my my job was to get it finished. Uh, so I would uh, I would come in. I would play each level. I'd bring some some testers with me. We'd play the levels, and when we found problems with it, we'd take tweak it here and there. Uh, but when it was good, we said. So let's stop here. Let's finish and go on to the next thing. So my, my main focus was 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 getting everything done. So I I, I wasn't around during the uh, when it was being innovative. So I, I can't talk about what what changes were made during that process or, or what decisions were made. So it was a very iterative process. It was extremely iterative. Yes. Uh- Before we jump to the next question about some other projects you worked on, uh, I'd like to bring up a question that I received in my uh, in my DMs. So um, you touched upon the story when you um, have joined uh, the game and then you you're putting your soul and heart in, in, into the game and then your business is just, you know, closing the contract with Paramount. And you spent like, I don't know, seven months of your life on something. Sometimes you spent like a couple years of your life on something. And uh, there are some business matters that you cannot influence that are basically putting your project on hold. And there are lots of producers and game designers watching us interested to know how do you tackle such situations? What's your coping mechanism and what would you advise them? Uh, not to get lost and not to get demotivated of you know working on the next game. You cry a lot. No, oh. no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm so that, sorry. No, that, you know, game development is it. You know, when I tell people that I'm a game producer and game designer, they think I play games all day long. And and you guys know, making games is hard work. You work long hours. It gets frustrating. You have these great ideas, but reality sets in, and it's too technically difficult. Or 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 you really have to stretch your artistic skills, or you have to deal with the business realities. So it, it, in, in, in one sense, we're, we're very blessed. We're very lucky to be doing this kind of work, make, making, making things that, products that, that make people happy. But on the other hand, it's still hard work. It's still hard work and there are disappointments along the way. And yeah, you, you, you put your heart and soul, you're trying to do your best, and then things go wrong. And uh, you, know, you, you, you develop a tough skin. So that, so that, so that you don't, you don't cry just yourself to sleep every night. Um, you know, it, 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 it's a matter of being a professional, uh, to also realize that the reality of it, you're, you're, you're both an artist, a creator, and you also have to be a professional and you, you, you have to be aware of, of the business realities of what you're doing. So it's tough. Although sometimes I look back at some of the people who are above me and I think, oh, they are such idiots. <laughs> <laughs> If only they had listened to me, it would have been so much better. But, you know, it, it's the reality of life. Things don't always work out the way you want. Yeah, so your recipe is developing the tough skin, thick skin. Tough skin, yes, and realize Stay you're a professional. professional. Stay professional. And, uh, you know, it's... it's, it's It, it's one of the big, hard, hard parts of it is, is knowing when to, when, when to fight your fights uh, to, to get the kind of game you want. Sometimes you have to, to give in to the realities, but sometimes uh, you have to fight hard against uh, the, the people who have the, the business decisions or uh, oh, who I have know. different ideas with you. Uh, so, and sometimes you, you're able to convince the business people that it's worth it. Another week on this game, a little bit extra money, you know, a few more people bring up brought onto the project or that maybe you have a vision for the game that they don't see. Maybe they don't think there's an audience for. Sometimes you can be successful in, in making your arguments and convincing them. For sure. For sure. I can say it a business person, as a business person that is often, you know, kind of con- convinced by the ideas. I know that Alexei had a lot of interest about King's Bounty. So Alexei probably wanted to ask something. Yes, that's right, David. Um, King's Bounty 2 turned out to be a, a very fresh and uh, quite a success, uh, I believe. And uh, what was your role in this project? Uh, I was not involved in King's Bounty. We, we call that Heroes of Might Magic Zero. Oh. It, was, it was the inspiration for, uh, for, uh, 
for the Heroes series. And it was followed by Heroes of Might and Magic 1, Heroes of Might and Magic 2, and I got involved with Heroes of Might and Magic 3. So that, that uh, uh, King's Bounty was dev- designed by John Van Canahan, who mm-hmm. was the founder of New World Computing. Uh, and uh, I think, I, I'm trying to remember who was the programmer on it. It was either Mark Caldwell or Phil Steinmeier. I think it was Mark Caldwell who programmed it. So it, it was those two that were behind it. It was designed to be a, a fantasy strategy tactics game uh, that uh, it, w- it, was, it was a good, solid game, but probably no more for inspiring the Heroes, th- Heroes series. Okay. Also, I know that you collaborated with NASA. Could you oh, yes, tell yes. us about your mission and how it is actually to work with All right. So the very first game company I worked for was called Eduware Services. And it was called Edgeware because it primarily did educational software, and uh, but it also did games, particularly games that taught people something that 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 said something about life or you learned something about uh, about some particular area of the world. And I started working for them when I was a college student, and I, I made my first games for them as a freelancer. But then when I graduated, I joined them full time as a game designer and programmer, and eventually became. Uh, became their uh, vice president of software development. Well, uh, one day we were approached by a NASA scientist by the name of Wes Huntress. He was a, uh, he was a, uh, a planetary scientist working, working for them, but he was also a gamer, and he had made, a, uh, made a, uh, a space shuttle simulation that we eventually called Rendezvous, uh, and he brought it to us and, uh, to be their publisher, his publisher. And I worked with him a little bit. I refined it, refined the game to make it a little bit more fun. Uh, and I wrote the manual that came with it. And so uh, we did publish that. And uh, it was a good enough experience that uh, he got together with another, with a, with a JPL engineer by the name of Charlie Colhays, who was the, the project manager of the Voyager space probe. And they wanted to make, because Charlie was a, a, a hiker and a, sur- a survivalist, they wanted to make a wilderness survival game. And so uh, uh, they worked with us. Uh, I did. I did the artwork for the game. I uh, I wrote the uh, I wrote the English language parser so that you could type in all your commands in English. I, I did the programming on that, and three of us worked together, and we created a we created a uh, created this. Uh, it may have been the first first person 3D game, real time 3D game, uh, ever created. I, I don't know if anyone's before that. Uh, or certainly a real-time 3D adventure game. Uh, and, uh, but then uh, our company was bought out by, uh, by a software, by, by an accounting software company uh, from, uh, from the East Coast who didn't know anything about the game industry, and they ran Edgeware out of business. So a group of us got together. We formed our own company called Electric Transit, and we got the rights to Rendezvous and Wilderness, and we, we, we sold that ourselves. Uh, and uh, Wes Huntress, who was, who was the uh, NASA JPL scientist, was one of my business partners in, in, in forming that company. So that was my involvement with NASA, working on, on those two games. Great story. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a great story. And I think it's also very inspiring because there are some people who are still like finishing their education, listening to us and knowing the stories that you can start with, uh, with something and then you become the software development director. And it's also important to hear to people. I'd like to bring up one more question from uh, one of um, iLogos leading game designers. Um, the question is still about Heroes of Might and Might and magic. I, I think that we wouldn't wouldn't go too far from this title today in our talk. Uh, the question is, from the player's perspective, which castle in Heroes 3 you consider the best? Oh, there is a... That's, that's a tough one. Because there are so many good ones. I would say my favorite is the uh, is the uh, the wizard one. Uh, that That's the one with the very tall spires and the snow around it. Uh, I like the creatures in it, but I, I, I like the artwork in it so much. Uh, that That's my favorite. Uh, of course, the castle is great, so is the dungeon. Uh, probably those three together, uh, I think, I think are the best ones uh, altogether. But uh, yeah, the, the, the wizard, the wizard tower is my favorite. 
The Wizard Tower. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'd like to touch upon a thing that is often like one of the most mysterious parts uh, in game development. Even right now in iLogos, when we are getting the uh, we're getting the game development contracts, uh, you can tell you know the roles and the responsibilities, the tasks of pretty much any role in the game. But when it comes to producer, there are so many meanings. There are so many, like each and every company would understand it differently. What does being a great pro game producer mean? What are what should be the you know the abilities, the skill set of a great game producer? And since producing is directly Ilya's area of expertise, I'd like him to step in and ask some questions, you know, prof about professional life hacks. Uh, about being a great producer. Yeah, thank you. Well, my, it might not be specifically the life hacks I had in mind, but just generally uh, with so much uh, and so many projects behind your back and hopefully more to come, uh, what do you think makes a good producer? The one that affects positively on the project that he's making and the team as well. The number one skill of a producer, I'd say, is communication and being able to communicate with a wide variety of people. You know, programmers are very different from artists, and they're very different from game designers. So you have to speak the language of each different discipline, That is, and that's not just the, uh, the, the terms they use, but maybe they're different personality types, so you have to and they have and and they also have different concerns so you have to be able to to speak with and empathize with everyone then you're also because you're the representative of the project and you're speaking to your management and salespeople and maybe even legal people if you deal with contracts you also have to understand them and their concerns so it's being able to communicate with many different types of people and 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 maintaining the balance of trying to find out how are you going to satisfy as many people as possible? Because uh, everyone wants different things. They all have different concerns. So it's, uh, it's I, I guess it's, it's having really good people skills is, is vital for being a producer, uh, along with not being able to identify early on what the project's about. If, what, what it is that you're trying to achieve, uh, what is the... Um, what is the vision for the project and keeping everyone mindful of that vision and everyone's going to look at it from a different perspective but if you can you you you're the tough person who has to to deal with everyone and and while still while still getting everyone to fall in line with what that vision is so communication maintenance of vision and then also having, a, let's go back to what I said before, having a very thick skin. Because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you're successful as a producer, the team gets all the credit, rightfully so. If everything goes wrong, you get all the blame. It's your fault. So you, you have to be able to, to be tough enough to, to, to deal with, uh, with all the problems. And if anything doesn't happen right, you, you've got to be tough enough to accept the blame. Still keep a smile on your face so that, they have confidence in with you to go on to the next project. Yeah, of course. And you got to keep playing your role in the projects as well. Uh, and with the so much insight in the game industry overall through all the years, um, what should be the main points of focus for the producer as well as the game designers in the early stages of development, especially with the people only starting up with their games? All right. I'd, I'd say that two things. One is, is having a clear vision for what your project is, what you're trying to achieve, to what experience are you trying to deliver for the player? Because there are lots of different ways to have fun. You can have fun for that. You can have a very easy game. That's, that's fun as a casual game or a very hardcore game. That's fun for hardcore players. Uh, you can have play a game that's very realistic or a game that's very fantasy oriented. They're both fun for different types of people. So figure out what, what type of fun is your game trying to deliver? And who is it trying to deliver to? Who who is your who is your uh, player going to be? Uh, and and measure everything against that, because number two thing to keep in mind is is that you you don't want to get the, the scope of the game too big. That's the number one cause of failed games, is is trying to create a game that's more more work to do, uh, 
and, and maybe beyond the skills of what your team is capable of, how much time you have, what the budget is. So maintaining your sc- uh, designing a game that fits within the scope um, and then uh, and then measuring everything you want to put into the game early on. Each feature, does it fit within the scope and does it fit within the vision? And that that's sometimes uh, one, uh, one of the most difficult things to do during during uh, uh, during pre-production because you're all excited about the game. You have all these great ideas and you have to be able to cut those features early on that don't fit in with your vision and don't fit in with the scope. So it's uh, it's it's that that was that that I would say is 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 what you most have to keep on keep mindful of in pre-production. Yeah. Thank you. And with uh, a lot of, uh, as well, involvement with the pro- different projects that you had, the games, maybe s- even some behind the curtain, helping your friends in the industry, something that might have happened. Maybe there is specific experience or a position that you remember from good or bad perspective that really burned into your memory. Oh, wow. There's, there's so many different things. Anything that, that that's really good or bad that... Uh, um, Boy, which 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 memory do I have to choose from? Um, I will say that uh, well, getting back to Heroes, uh, the uh, what made Heroes three so good? It, it's again the working relationship of all the team members, um, and then followed by Heroes of My Magic four, where there was a lot of different points of view in developing it, and not everyone got along as well. So that made it difficult. It's uh, usually it, it all evolves around my memories. All evolve around people. How well did we get along? You know, uh, either with the team or with our client or or with whoever is in management above us. It uh, it the, the the hard work behind a game and the technical difficulties that that you ran into um, those those you tend to forget. Uh, it, it's the relationships between people. If 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 they've been really good. That's who you remember. If they were really bad, that's also what you remember uh, in general. So it, it, in, in each of my projects, I, I always think about how, how well did I get along with everyone? Thank you. Thank you, David. And um, before I move forward to the next question, uh, I'd like to tell to our audi- audience that we're going to have a blog related to the questions from the audience. So, guys, I um, uh, please be enthusiastic. Please do not hesitate to send your questions, even the most uh, strange ones that you wanted to ask, but you were, you know, you had fear of asking. And uh, in the meantime, we can still speak about what's behind the th- the scenes of the producer role. So taking radical producer decisions like producer is the person who's responsible for the game in front of the stakeholders and can you remember any radical decisions product decisions that you have taken and that have completely changed the way the product was moving forward radical product decisions um about the uh, about the game itself you know most 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 of the games I've worked on, it ended up being pretty much what I envisioned it to be. So, in terms of probably radical, uh, it's probably more a case of of making changes from the original scope. I would say what one thing that was radical about Hero, uh, Heroes of My Magic Four was my decision to make have the heroes be on the on the battlefield. That, that was a radical departure. And it was, as I said before, it was, one that, it was one that, that probably didn't pay off for, for, for some players as it did for others. Um, oh, the very first game here, here as a game designer, I'll, I'll give you a radical decision as a game designer. The very first big game I've made was uh, called The Prisoner. And it was based upon the British television series about somebody who probably was a spy who resigns from his job, he's kidnapped, and then taken to this remote village where they try to find out why he resigned. And I made a video game based upon that television series, and I tried to adapt a lot of the themes to it. And one of the theme, my interpretations of the show, was that that the person he was imprisoning himself, uh, 
He had to, to really set himself free by being an individual. Uh, and so I want to create a game in which you are captured by the game because you're playing the game. And once you've made the realization that you chose to be captured by the game because your decision to play the game, you could become free by realizing you're playing a game and you can leave it at any time. So I wanted to make that game uh, so that as, it, as long, it, it had a, it had a English parser system so that you could type your, all your commands into it in conversations. And if you could type in at one point, I am playing a game, uh, or this is all a game, that's all you need to do to win the game. So you could win it. At, uh, my decision was you could win it at, at any time. That was, that was <laughs> at the very beginning. And my management was not happy with that idea. I uh, know. Yeah. They said, we can't do a game that, that if the secret gets out, you could w anyone who heard the secret could win at the very beginning. And I thought thematically that was very important to it. So we, we argued about it back and forth all night long. And I was pretty stubborn at first. Uh, and I wasn't going to budge. And finally, around midnight, I'm thinking, well, you know, I, here's a compromise. That's the way you win the game, but you also had to achieve a certain score in the game first. You had to have a certain number of adventures. Uh, and I rationalized it as the player had to, a player character had to come to that conclusion after a certain number of experiences. So uh, I, uh, I, I changed the game so that you couldn't make that, you couldn't make, uh, reveal that truth until you had played it past a certain point. So that, that was my compromise uh, to it. So, uh, yeah, what I wanted to do was radical at first, and I, I, I tempered my decision for, for, for business reasons. See, sometimes I think business people are really good. They, 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 <laughs> they, 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 they help you sell your game. They, they help you realize what the realities are to think to, from an SI perspective. And that, that's one case where the business people really helped me out and I think made it a better game. Thank you. That's that. That's so full of you know, so full of insights. Uh, sometimes you want you know you want to take a really radical decision as a game designer, but maybe it's a good idea to make a breathe in and breathe out, and then talk to your business stakeholders and then see what. Yeah, yeah. Radical radical ideas can be very good. But they they can be good to inspire you to come up with with even better ideas. Mm -hmm. So it's great to be radical at the very beginning when you're designing stuff, um, but you don't necessarily have to stick with that really radical idea to the very end. As, as long as it's enough to inspire you to make, uh, make wise game design decisions, uh, you don't have to take your, your, you don't have to abandon being really creative. On the other hand, you, you don't have to take that extreme creativity to the point where you, you may be making a game that may not be as much fun for as many people as possible. Yeah, yeah. Guys, uh, everyone, to everyone who's listening to us uh, just now, uh, I'd like to announce a small um, kind of competition. I'd like to add a little bit of gamification to what we're doing. And the one who's uh, like, I'm getting some questions right now. You send the questions to me. And in the end, I would ask David to say what was the question that he liked the most. And uh, we would award the author of the question um, with an autograph, so with a signature. So please, I encourage you to uh, ask a question if you still haven't. Uh, and the question, the next question I wanted to ask was about the young generation. So all the people who are listening to us today, they were raised alongside video, video games. And is there a message you would want to um, share with them as to uh, where you'd like this game, you know, game development business to go forward? I would say that to anyone who's interested in, 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 in making games, make games. Uh, they're, they're, I get approached by a lot of young people who want to break in. How do I get started? And it's just so easy to get started now. Uh, a lot easier than, than, than when I started in the industry. It's so, there, 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 there are a number of different game engines that are free. Um, you download it. You can download the game engine. There are a lot of tutorials out there. It's real easy to learn simple games. And start, indeed, start simple with your very first game. 
don't, you're not going to make a triple A game by yourself. Uh, the triple the A games are the games with the biggest budgets. They have huge teams, a lot of money behind it. Don't try that yourself. Just make a very simple game. You can have a very creative idea. If you're good at art, you could have a really good, uh, really good, very uh, uh, specialized art to it. Uh, very distinct art style. Um, you could do a crazy, wild, innovative game. That's fine for your first game. Just go go with something small and simple that you're very passionate about it. And realize, don't get discouraged by the fact that it may not it may not turn out as well as you hope. Because you're when you make your very first game, you're going to go and 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 discover when you're sent out to the world and people play for the first time they're going to tell you how much it sucked how terrible it was and probably all of our very first games suck uh, that's okay you make another one and you make another one and then you make another one uh and hopefully eventually you'll, you'll get one that 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 people really like will sell but uh yeah it's 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 just making games it's a skill you have to develop and nobody's an expert at first and uh you know, there, there are so many stories where somebody's made a series of games and they didn't sell and they were about to get up, give up when they were going to make one last game and that game became a hit. I think with, 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 with Ro Rovio, they made like 50 games. Yeah, like 50 or 52. Right, right, Be, right, right. Before they hit Angry Birds. And it all started off with just a sketch, right, of, of, of an Angry Bird. And they just hit upon that one. You never know when you're going to hit upon that one idea that everyone else loves. So... You know, just keep at it. Keep at it. Keep trying over and over and over again. Uh, you know, you refine your skills. You'll find what people like. And, and uh, you know, don't feel bad about yourself if, if you fail a number of times. Failure, failure is learning. And sometimes when you fail, it's, it's not necessarily all your fault. It's tough to make a, make a hit game because uh, it involves marketing. It involves finding the right audience. And it involves having everything work together in ways that you couldn't possibly replicate. There's, there's no recipe for making a great game. So it's a lot of trial and error. So just, just keep at it. You know, keep finding what your passion is and pursue that passion. And just, just keep trying over and over uh, until, uh, you know, you, you develop your skills and you, you create a game that's the right game at the right time that, uh, that hopefully will become a hit for you. Yeah, there's there there's used to be a saying like make uh, make love not war, and we can rephrase it and say make games not war. Well, at least war, war games, <laughs> only in such case. <laughs> yeah, no, it's going to make war games. I like a lot of war yeah, games. Yeah, yeah, war games. Make war games not war. Then, <laughs> uh, okay. So um, I have received several new questions. Uh, there's an interesting kind of personal question to you. Do you remember the moment? Um, if, when you first realized that um, there's a character, Sir, Sir Malik, uh, under, uh, in uh, Heroes 3, was there any kind of internal protest? Like, oh, uh, I don't know, I need, to remove, uh, I need to remove this character from the game or anything like that. Well, uh, all right, so here's how Sir Malik came about. Uh, I, I, I was on vacation for a week because... Uh, uh, my, uh, my second son had been born, so I took a, took a, took a week off for uh, paternity leave. And when I came back, uh, the team had filled up my office with balloons. So that, that was very nice. And I had to clear them all the way so I could sit in my chair. But they, and then they, they said, uh, David, we, we have something to show you that we put into the game. And we want to know if you approve it. So they led me over, and they showed me Sir Mullock. Which was a, it was actually a, they had taken a photograph of me that was uh, that had actually been done for one of the the Might and Magic role playing games. And I forget I don't know if it was six or seven. It was supposed to be a a, a, a meeting of of the town elders, and they were supposed to even give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down about a quest that you had taken. So, and and I I had been dressed in a in a Renaissance fair costume that actually belonged to. Uh, to one of our artists or the husband of one of our artists and she brought it and I dressed up in the big the hat and the white frilly shirt and a picture of me doing thumbs up and a picture of me doing thumbs down so that was that for that game but they my, my team decided they want to create a hero based upon me for, for heroes of my magic so they did that to me then they had the description of the hero 
that talked about how he tries to motivate his troops by being spasmatic, by, uh, and, and foolishly thinking that that would motivate them. So that was kind of a, that was kind of a joke that they played on me. They were they were teasing me a little bit, but I looked at it, I laughed, and uh, it gave like plus one speed to the uh, to the units. So it plus was two really, speed. If I'm yeah, not yeah. So it was a really good skill to have. I looked at it, I laughed. I said, okay, you can put it into the game because I I knew they they put it in with love. So uh, so but yeah, that that's when I realized when I came back from uh, from paternity leave and they had done this as kind of a joke and I I laughed and I said yeah you can keep it in. <laughs> okay, so you you've taken it with the humor. And uh, what about some crazy journalists or crazy haters, game reviewers? Did you have any cases that were like kind of touching to you? And how did you how did you handle some such cases? Oh, that every time that that someone tells me how my, how big of an influence that Heroes of My Magic Three had in their childhoods, and how it got got, got them through tough times, uh, I. I'm always touched, and that that makes me feel good. Uh, we had no idea when we when we made this game. We're 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 just thinking about let's make a successful game that will sell well, that'll make the fans happy. Uh, but uh, it's, when, when I hear that 20 years later, people are still playing it, and still have fond memories of it. That that's really touching, and every time I hear it, it makes me feel. I, I get a little teary eyed oh. about it. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's nice that 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 someone worked so hard on uh, had a nice memory. Although, I've also had some journalists <laughs> tell me. I had one journalist tell me in an interview, "How do you feel about the fact that people are so addicted to Heroes of My Magic Three that they got kicked out of their jobs in the army and they got they got booted out of they 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 got kicked out of uh, out of out of university because they weren't doing their studies." And and I have to reply, I, I don't feel good about that at all. It's just a game. Don't, it's not, I'm not responsible for, for ruining people's lives. Um, if, if that happened to you, you're taking your gameplay way too seriously. It's supposed to be what you do in your, in your spare time, when you need a break, when uh, you, you want to relax. But don't give up your, your, your schoolwork, your, your, your work for your job just to play a game. So that, you know, game, game addiction can be a pro problem for some people. That, that's a real problem that, that we as, as, as game developers need to be aware of and need to fight against. But uh, yeah, when, when, uh, when I've gotten hit by journalists with questions about, about people being addicted to Heroes of Mind Magic 3, that's, that's, uh, that, that, that's probably the toughest question I've gotten. I actually yeah. had this question in the list. <laughs> oh, but great! Then I thought, but then I thought that well, probably, uh, probably David will touch upon this question at some point, and I was right in the you guess. You were right. <laughs> so uh, I have another question. Mm, you know, the mobile gaming is booming and it's constantly de developing and right now it's the biggest platform and there is still an opinion that this is um, a sign of stagnation of the video game and industry uh, there are lots of bad mobile games do you find this mobile gaming trend um, a temporary trend or actually the major way where they gaming industry is going and um, is there a sense in staying concerned about this fact or maybe just admitting that it is as it is you know i'm i'm looking on the table in front of us and i see my iphone i see a thing I, I, i've seen some others everyone you know walking around today i'm looking seeing everyone looking on their mobile phone mobile phones are not going away they, they become such an important part of our lives And it, it makes sense that we're playing games on them. I, I do not see it going away. And just because some game, games are simplified for mobile phones so that you can play them easily, pick them up easily, get into them easily, leave them easily when you have to go off and doing something wrong, it's just a, a different type of game or, or a different type of game format. I, I don't see anything wrong with it. I think it's great. I think that it's great that we have games that we can play casually, games that we can play on the fly, but it's also great that we have hardcore games, games that we may spend all night playing on our consoles or on our PCs. 
it's a it's a big world out there. There are a lot of different types types of people. There should be a lot of different types of games. There, there, yeah, there are some games I, I enjoy playing for just five minutes, and then there are some games I, I enjoy devoting hours and hours and hours to. It, there, there's room for both. There's room for both. It's, yes. Uh, it's the second time you're saying, like, uh, there's, you know, there's a room, uh, room for both, and it's the second time unexpected reply to me. I love this talk. So um, thank you, audience, for being so active. I'm getting a lot of questions right now. We'll do our best to fit all of them uh, into our timing as we're a little bit, you know, um, coming close to the end, but we'll do our best to ask everything. So there's an interesting question that came in about... The best things, like what were the best things uh, in games like 40 years ago? And what is the best thing in, in, the, in the games today? Is it the same thing or is it something completely different? All right. Best thing about games 40 years ago was the experimentation going on where there weren't established game genres yet. We could try new things. So I, I think the level of innovation was what was exciting 40 years ago. What's exciting now is the level of quality that we have in our games. The quality is in artwork, the quality in, in, uh, in, 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 in sound design, the quality in music, the quality of uh, the fact that we, we can design games that are so complex. Uh, I, think that's, uh, I think that's great. Uh, it, the games are, are more immersive now than ever before. Um, and I'm very excited about the opportunities presented by VR and AR coming up to, to even make that experience uh, even more, more immersive for us so that it completely surrounds us. Um, so, uh, yeah, early innovation and now, now the professionalism and, and the immersion of games, uh, I, I think, are, the, are, are, are what I liked about the past and what, I, what, I, what I'm excited about in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's hard to argue. And um, do you have a practice of putting in some probably secret messages or secret ideas into the game that you are working on to be, you know, some secret, especially from you uh, and somebody would guess it or not? Do you have such practice? Are you talking about Easter eggs? So like yeah, surprises like to something discover? Like, something like Easter eggs, some secret message from you specifically. Uh, that, that I've done before? Yeah, yeah, in any of the games. I think that people would be enthusiastic then to play those games and try to find them. Let's see. Uh, um, it's been a long time. I would say, here's something. If you, if you, ever, if you can ever find a Apple II simulator to play my game Prisoner 2. So that's, that's an old one. I made that in 1981, I think. Um, and it was, a, it was a remake of my 1979 game, The Prisoner. And in it, I, I did it. Uh, it was a case of me, how do I take a game that was very well received and, and, and do something a little bit different to it? And I made, made Prisoner 2 a satire, a little, I put in more parody of, of video games at the time. And so if, uh, if, if you, if you were ever to find, I think that it is available online some places with a simulator. If you could find some parodies I've made of some early Sierra online games. And there was also a parody of, not many people remember this publisher. It was an early publisher called Programma International. Um, I also did some satire of their games in my games. So if you want to, want to play true game historian, game archaeologist, go way back in the past, dig up that old game and find some parodies in it of, of other old games from that time. That, that could be a, a, a fun little pastime for you. Interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I received a question from our co-founder, Alexander, um, who's asking... Do you think that the current state of game industry is kind of plagued by endless sequels, milking of old 
franchises and remasters. And um, how do you think like more creativity and taking risks of new IPs can be facilitated for the modern AA or AAA games? Yeah, I mean, I mean that's true. It's not just it's not just for games, but also we we find that in the American film industry, where oh, we have yeah. a lot of sequels that that seem follow the same formula, and that's all because you know games and the movies bigger and bigger, bigger bigger budgets. So less willing to take risks of losing the money. So you you try to, to you look at what was successful before and do that same thing again. So yeah, that, that's true. There, 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 there are a lot of cases where you have sequels that don't seem very innovative. But where you do find innovation, and this is true with games and movies, are in indie projects, indie games, indie movies. Uh, that that's where you can find a lot of lot of lot of uh, uh, new ideas and risk, risky, uh, risky attempts to do things. So you, if you look for them, don't look, look at what's, what's heavily advertised. It's usually the, 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 the safe, generalized, formulaic stuff that's heavily advertised. But if you make the effort to go and follow what's happening in the indie worlds, um, you can find some truly innovative games. Um, you can also try to be a little bit innovative if, if you are working on a, on a big project with a big IP, you can try maybe doing something a little bit special in, in one aspect of it, as long as you don't lose the, uh, as long as you still try to stick to uh, what's popular about the IP. Still, still, uh, you know, e each IP has a brand identity, and if you're imitating, a, if you're if you're if you're creating a derivative product of a movie or television show, there are certain things that you have to stick to to satisfy the audience, but. Maybe maybe there there there's there's something novel or risky that you can try that's that's a little bit of a risk, uh, so that you can get it uh, hopefully get it past uh, the people that that are responsible for making sure that you're doing your job and, and keeping it faithful to the to the IP. Oh yeah, uh, I just I just have to announce to the audience that we are a little bit running out of time, so uh, I will be able to mention two more. Uh, just two more questions. Uh, so I have another question from um, Andrew um, Faraponova Dialogos. Uh, the question is again about Heroes of Might and Magic 3. Uh, so when you worked on this uh, title, uh, have you imagined that it will greatly influence and basically form the whole generation of players? So was that this global goal from the very beginning or... Like that, that something that will remain forever in their hearts. This is the one part of the question. Or and the other part of the question is, uh, why did many cheats of um, in uh, Heroes Three uh, come specifically from the Matrix? <laughs> okay, why that? Well, let's see. Um, to answer the first question, we knew that here the Heroes of My Magic series had had a very loyal fan base. And we we tried very hard to 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 uh, to to keep the fans informed about what we were doing, uh, stay in contact with the fans. We assigned some of our uh, members of our team to to play what, the role of what we call today community managers. So uh, we 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 were mindful of the fans, and we 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 did want to keep keep all the fans happy. But we had no idea that uh, that the game would be popular years and years from now. In that I could go into a, to a cab ride today and have a have a have a have a have a taxi driver say that they, they were a player of the game. We had no idea about that. We just wanted to keep keep the fans we had happy. So that it's it's, it's, a, it's a nice surprise. Touches my heart. Makes everyone. I'm still in touch with 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 everyone. Most everyone that that worked on Heroes Three, and uh, uh, it, it all makes us happy to know that uh, you have such fond memories of the game and that so many people still remember it. Uh, that that. That it makes it feel like it was all worthwhile because making games is hard work. Um, but uh, there, there was a second part of your question the, well, about the Matrix movie. Oh, why the Matrix? It was uh, it was I, I don't. It was kind of a a, uh, a habit we had at the time, or, or that whenever we uh, whenever we did cheat codes, we do it for the current popular movie. So that was 1999 that we were working on Heroes of, of My Magic 3, and that's when The Matrix came out. So that's where, uh, so we decided to do all of our cheat codes based upon The Matrix. 
And then for Heroes of Mind Magic 4, I wanted to make all the cheat codes based upon Lord of the Rings because I was a huge Lord of the Rings fan. In fact, at the time, I was the, uh, the Internet's biggest expert on the differences between the Lord of the Rings books and the Lord of the Rings movies. So I was big in Lord of the Rings fandom. So when I made Heroes of Mind Magic 4, I wanted to make all the cheat codes based upon, <laughs> based upon uh, on, on Lord of the Rings. But uh, then our legal department got concerned that, that we might be opening ourselves up to a lawsuit. And they, 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 they told me I couldn't do it. So we had to make much more generic cheat codes instead. So that, that, that broke my heart that we had to do that. It was sad. I it, meant, was very I sad. it was very sad. It was for me. All right. So we have the last question that I can tell today uh, just because we're running out of time. Thank you, audience, for being so active. There's a question from Andri uh, asking, have you heard of the Disciple series and have, have you played it? And in overall, what games like Heroes of Might and Magic 3 would you recommend to play that have that same uh, amount of fun and experience? I've heard of uh, the Disciples game. Uh, I haven't played it yet. Uh, there, there's just so many games I hear about and, and read about and see reviews of and people tell me about. And usually I, I don't, I, I tell myself I'm, I'm going to play that ne game next and I wind up not playing because I just can't find the time. I'm usually better if it's a casual game or, or, or an iPhone game, usually better about playing it. Um, but uh, if, if, you know, my favorite game series of all time is Civilization. So if you if you like Heroes of Mind Magic Three, it's it's not it's not fantasy based, but uh, it, uh, it 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 has addictive gameplay. That's my uh, that's if you haven't tried it out yet, that's a game you should be playing the the Civilization series. Thank you so much. Thank you, David for coming to iLogos. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you, Alexei, for preparing such a great questions. I had a super pleasure hosting this talk today. Um, I hope, David, it wasn't too boring for you, too. And uh, thanks for the visit. And we have to finish now. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.